Hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you from my car. Um, uh, I'm outside right now, but welcome to our program tonight. Um, on the Mary, um, and she'll be going through um, East Grand Rapids and talking about them, um, about East Grand Rapids. And I have a little bio for you. So Hold, uh, bear with me because I have one device tonight um, and usually I have two. So I'm going to be switching in between. So one moment as I get the bio pulled up. All right. So Mary Dirsch um, has been the volunteer curator for the city of East Grand Rapids history room since 1993. She has spent her career as a librarian working in academic and public libraries and currently serves at the East Grand Rapids branch of the Kent District Library. Community volunteerism is a passion of hers. She has served on the board of the Friends of East Grand Rapids Library since 1993 and has involved and was involved in campaigning for the expansion and renovation of the community center and the library, um, specifically the turtle and fish aquariums in the children's rooms, and also giving countless local history presentations. Um, she especially enjoys telling the East Grand Rapids unique history to all of the second graders <laughs> um, who, as part of their class lessons, walk over to the community center to hear about Ramona Amusement Park and the large Reeds Lake steamboats of bygone days. So um, put all of your COVID free hands together for Mary Dirsch. Welcome everyone. I'm sure that uh, many of you that are out there tonight have, I've probably talked to you online. Um, the History Room is on Facebook. It's on its own website. It's in the East Grand Rapids Library. And East Grand Rapids, I always like to say, is a very small town with such a grand history. And we have just so many nice things to talk about. The program that I'm going to do tonight is focusing on, on homes and streets and buildings and the people that live or have lived in the area. And it's entitled On the Street Where You Live, Down the Block and Through the Years in East Grand Rapids. It's going to involve some postcards, photographs, newspaper clippings, um, memories, and so forth. So we're going to start out with one of our old postcards, uh, circa 1916 of Cambridge Boulevard. And so I thought, let's do a little research. Um, I, as Angela said, I am the curator for the East Grand Rapids History Room. And through the years, I've been privileged to know so many people that are important in the history of East Grand Rapids. Uh, this photograph here with the people sitting in the history room, you can see the gentleman in the cap there. That's uh, Captain Bill Poisson. He was the last steamboat captain of the Ramona on Reeds Lake. And his wife, Grace, sitting there also in one of our old reproduction gaslight lamps. The history room serves as a museum and also a library of local history. It 
is on the upper level of the East Grand Rapids Library. It exists through donations. It has no dedicated funding. So we do this uh, just through the love of the people that love history. And anytime something is added to the history room, even if it's a memory or an artifact, that's how the collection grows. We do get some funding, but not through grants and so forth. And then you notice over here, here's the pilot wheel of the Steamboat Ramona. It was also on the Major Watson, and that is in the history room. So come and put your hands on history and visit the history room. It's open when the library is open. Uh, just recently, East Grand Rapids changed out its business signage, its Gaslight Village signage, and they took down the old uh, signs. And so I said, well, let's get that right in the history room, too. And if you've been in the history room, it's not a big room, but we just keep adding. So let's take a little walk down the streets in old East Grand Rapids and in current day East Grand Rapids too. And we'll go back to that postcard and the postcard of Cambridge Boulevard in Sherman Streets. So we took this postcard and I do a lot of house research and so forth. So I took a look at it and I thought, what are those houses? Could I find a house in this postcard. And so that's what I set out to do. And I started with that with no other real knowledge. This is a postcard done by the Grand Rapids Company, Haybor Company. And that was downtown um, circa 1916, 15, 16 on uh, 3 Ionia Avenue. So I found what I believe to be the same location. And this is a current picture of Cambridge Boulevard and Sherman Street. And I found what I believe to be the house that's featured in that postcard. So I thought, okay, let's do a little house research. So 601 Cambridge Boulevard was built in 1914, 1915 by Louis de la Martyr. And I thought right away, Louis de la Martyr, my history antenna went right up. He was such a big player in Ramona Park days and the Grand Rapids Railway Company and so forth. And this is an arts and crafts style home here. So I thought, let's do some history on Louis de la Martyr. He was a showman, a transportation official, and a civic leader. He died in, in uh, actually on my birthday. And he started out as a young boy working in the Majestic Theater in 1903, and he became the manager of Ramona Park in 1903, and he went right to the end in 1954 of Ramona Park. He was a very, very big involved in local government in East Grand Rapids, member of the school board. He helped to build the first East Grand Rapids High School, which is now Wealthy Elementary. He was president of the Peninsular Club. He was high up in the Rotary, president of EGR State Bank, which is now currently Hoffman Jewelers Building. He was on the team that put together the Grand Rapids Civic Auditorium. In his teens, he was a clerk. Then he was a secretary of the Grand Rapids Railway Company. By 1920, he was its president and general manager. By 37 through 54, he was the president of Grand Rapids Motor Coach Company. He worked uh, directly with Benjamin Hanchett, who was also very much involved in the park and the motor coach company. He retired at the end of the final season of Ramona Park, which was in 54, and he retired and he went to Florida and he died the next year. But he was the manager of Ramona Park and he helped along with Oren Stair, who was another was manager, um, really build Ramona Park into what it came to be. This is a photograph here from 1914. And I like to show this to the second graders. I like to show it to anybody who's listening to a local history and wants to learn. This is um, the business district from back in 1914. And it does show the site of Ramona Park. Ramona Park was the 21 acre park and the roller coaster the derby racers stretched all the way across where our Jacobson's was and across what is currently our grocery store DNW's parking lot. And it backed right up into the backyard of the cafeteria hair salon on Lovett. This is a scene uh, taken uh, from, this picture was taken probably from the top of the Ramona Theater Pavilion. And it looks out over Wealthy Street, which was then Michigan, called Michigan Street. Um, the, currently we have a 
little store called or restaurant called Crazy Charlie's. And Crazy Charlie's is this white building right here. And that's one of the oldest buildings, uh, you know, existing from that time period over 100 years ago. Back then it was Morgan's General Store. We'll learn a little bit more about it. The Jackrabbit Derby Racer went up in 1914. The pavilion here, which was the, the dance hall, casino, uh, Ramona Gardens Pavilion, went up in, in 1912. So back to that house again, after Jayla Martyrs uh, wanted, he moved to a couple other houses, which we'll talk about, but he sold the house to Claude Hurd and his wife for about $15,000. Claude Hurd was also in the entertainment business and he was a treasurer of the United Light and Railway Companies in Grand Rapids. So he was also involved in the railway company. So he sold it basically to a friend. He also was involved in the Knights Templar and was a big businessman also in Grand Rapids. Claude and his wife, Aura, uh, lived basically from the late 1870s to, he lived to 1965, she died um, much sooner. Whenever I do a house history, I research the people that lived in those houses. I do a lot of house histories for people, so you can always come my way. Louis de la Martyr moved on. So he moved down. Uh, next house was Ethel Street in East Town. But then a couple of years later, he moved to this house on Lake Drive. And we all drive by it almost every day on our way to downtown. So he moved in there, 1222 Lake Drive in 1920. Dale Martyr, as we said before, this is a younger picture of him, was involved in the school board and so, so forth. And about 1917, a new school was being planned to be built in East Grand Rapids, and he was very involved in it. And the school was going to replace the old Greenwood School. The new schoolhouse was going to be the Wealthy Street, what we know is, is a Wealthy Street School. And it, now it's a schoolhouse condos. But before that, from in 1891, it was the Greenwood School. And it stood on the corner of Greenwood and Wealthy Street. And it was a good sized schoolhouse. It was a four room schoolhouse. They used to divide the classrooms up with the uh, rolling chalkboards. So when it was time to put up the new Wealthy Street School, um, he thought, you know, his business mind, we're not gonna rip it down. And I surely wish people had that mindset these days. So what he did, this was a schoolhouse that uh, was in the graded school district, number three fractional townships of Grand Rapids and Paris, County of Kent, state of Michigan. This is where it was located on the corner of Wealthy and Greenwood. Right about there. And so, he thought, let's not rip it down, let's keep it. A wealthy Street School was built um, in 1917 and grades one through nine were taught there. One through eight were in the old Greenwood Schoolhouse. In 1928, the new East Grand Rapids High School opened. It's currently in Wealthy Elementary. In 1963, the current high school opened and then the old high school became Wealthy Elementary. And so there are a lot of articles that do talk about this. The new school was planned and it was built um, in 1917. It was $80,000 project, grades K through nine on two acres of ground. It was going to be used as a social center as well as a school and it have an auditorium that held 300 people. And it also then began to serve in 1928 as the administration building. Before that, the East Grand Rapids Schools administration uh, held their meetings in a house along Wealthy, which is no longer there. So what Dale Martyr did, he was very clever. He chopped the old Greenwood Schoolhouse in two and he moved it down the bull of, down Greenwood to the curve, the bend on Greenwood. And those two sections are still there today. For a good while there, De La Martyr lived in one half of the schoolhouse, 543, 541 Greenwood. 
And through the years, the house has taken on, there's two houses there now, they're both private. At one type time, they wanted to move a doctor's office in there, but it didn't get zoning permission. And this is 543 Greenwood, basically today, uh, that's been remodeled and kept up by the family that lives in there. Good size. And this is a view from probably 1982 of the two sections of the schoolhouse on Greenwood. Greenwood Street is a very historical little street. I, there are a lot of other things to talk about in the second half of this program, which we're not doing tonight. I talk about other sections of the street. But let's go back to De La Martyr because he moved again and he moved down Robinson Road and he moved and he built a large house on Fisk Lake in 1927. 29, the house was built there. He purchased a parcel of land from Ben E. West and his father, Judson West. They were big time in drug, drug stores in Grand Rapids, which I'll talk about shortly. They moved to 2100 Robinson Road, and this is another postcard, circa 1910-1915. And they built on Robinson Road, um, this fantastic house there. And it's it's beautiful. It sits down on Fisk Lake. It's uh, um, Italianite. It was built by local architect Don Lakey, built in 27. And here's the view from Fisk Lake. 1.6 acres, six bedrooms, five full bathrooms, two half baths. And then interior pictures. This house may or may not be on the market now. It was for a while. Some more views. Beautiful interior. So families that after De La Marta retired in 54 and he moved to Florida, the house was sold. And Court and Patricia Gravengood moved in. And Gravengood, um, it has a relationship to uh, Major Amasa Brown Watson. So the steamboat on the lake, the Grab and Good family is a, a relative. And that's a whole other little speech we're not doing tonight, but there is a connection there. It's a small world. There's a connection all over the place with, with local history. By 1970, William and Lois Halliday moved in to the house. In 1986, Michael and Kathy Marisone, and they are the current residents of that house. After Ramona Park closes and Grand Rapids Motor Coach Company is sold in 54, De La Marta moves permanently to his house in Lake Wales, Florida and passed at the age of 82 next year. This is a view of the Derby Racer taken from Wealthy Street, kind of more towards the lake there. And here is an aerial view. Uh, circa 1945 of Vermona Park with all the rides that we would have, the aero swings, the miniature railroad tracks that encircled the park, the Derby Racer. The Derby Racer was a second entity of roller coaster before the Derby Racer came in 1906, 1908, there was an aerial roller coaster or aerial coaster just a figure eight before that. And you will see that in some of the old postcards. We had Ramona Gardens Pavilion right here. We had the theater, which had a zenith could hold 1700 people and sat up over the west shore of the lake. It reads, this is a lakeside drive and Reeds Lake. The carousel and all of the picnic grounds and so forth. And the trolley would come up the different entities, the different types of transportation would come up wealthy off of Sherman onto wealthy and come in the trolley loop and go around here and they could get, you could pay your fare. It was, Ramona Park was a true trolley park. The transportation company owned it, not unlike a small um, Coney Island. You pay for your transportation, get in free to the park, but you pay for all the rides and concessions and food once you get there. But let's move west down Lake Drive. And we're gonna take a little walk here. This is a corner, I believe, of um, Laurel and, um, and Lake Drive. And we're gonna look at 1874 Lake Drive, the George Young Farmhouse. And the Young family was a pioneer family in East Grand Rapids. They came here shortly after the Reed family came. And as a matter of fact, they bought their property from the Reed family, the Ezra Lewis Porter Reed. And this is 
um, a fanciful artist rendering from the, the, uh, the 1876 Kent County Historical Atlas has a lot of really, really neat, it's probably vanity uh, drawings, but here we see what is now Lake Drive, which was Clinton back then. We see Sherman Street going this way, and then the transportation uh, would take people up Sherman and get them on to Wealthy and down to the lake. And this was the George Young Farmhouse at 1874 Lake Drive. That address still exists today. And the house that was built there, we're going to talk about it. The house that was built on that property stood on that property from 1854 until it was demolished in 2016, but it wasn't in the same location. Uh, and in 1857, it did, that, that little farmhouse started out as a log cabin and eventually was made into this. I don't know if it really was a, not really a Dutch colonial, but kind of a colonial style. It was built right on the front lawn of what is now 1874 Lake Drive, and it was 1874 Drive, that old house, the, the uh, young farmhouse. And the original young farmhouse moved, was moved in 1952, 54, right, right around that time period. And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, a couple by the name of Mueller bought the property, bought that old farmhouse. They lived there for a little while, but then they wanted to build a new house. So Frederick Mueller of Mueller Furniture Company built this ranch house, which is on that property today. He built it behind the old young farmhouse. And what he was going to do is just dig a pit in the ground, like a big swimming uh, pool pit and just knock the house in there. But another family decided they would like to buy that house and move it. And they did. Um, and it was purchased and it was moved down on Anderson Drive, not too far from Lakeside School. And it was moved there by the Coral family. And I'll go back to George Young. He lived from 1799 to 1870. He was an EGR pioneer, like I said, arriving just a short time after the Reed family. And the, the original rough hewn log beams were in the basement of that old house. And it was thought of and known as the oldest um, standing house in East Grand Rapids. Uh, lore says that it once served as an Indian trading post and that a later occupant, perhaps George Young Jr., Civil War General, often rested his pig leg on a notched groove in the front window still as he stood keeping watch out the window. This is a photo of Frederick Henry um, Mueller, um, Mueller Furniture Company. He served as a U.S. representative from the State Board um, of Agriculture of Michigan. He was also a delegate representative, National Convention from Michigan, and was the United States Secretary of Commerce from 59 to 61. In 50, 1951, he built that ranch house behind the old farmhouse. And Robert Coral and his wife, he was from Mutual Benefit Life Insurance Company. They bought that house and they moved it to the Anderson Street property. Mrs. Coral's uh, father, um, uh, Dr. A.B. Smith, had a big farm property on that, on that area and that's where they moved the house. Um, and then in 1972, the Corals were, uh, 88 Corals moved out. Uh, I'm sorry, 72, the Corals moved out. James Vahi, moved in in 88, Bob Beeman moved in in 2016, that house was demolished. And it had a historical plaque on the front of the house, but East Grand Rapids uh, has decided to not have historical districts. So it was not protected, sadly. And there are articles on it, which talks about the oldest structure was still a gracious home back in the eighties. Um, here's a picture of George Young Jr sitting on the porch there uh, way back when. So it would have been back before 1917, he's sitting on the porch here with his children, uh, uh, Lillian and George, circa 1900. And we have old photos of the, the George Young family. So we have George Jr. right sitting in the front of here and his sister Lillian and brother Claire, William and Clarence. 
And the father of the Brad, George Young married um, um, uh, Susan Bradford. And she was, uh, her family goes way back in history out in the West, on the East Coast in Bristol, um, Rhode Island and so forth. And I can't, let me see if I can move this here so I can read it. Um, her father, Captain Durfee T. Bradford was in the shipping industry in Rhode Island. And their great grandmother told them, because Susan and her sister were twins, of General Washington's visit to Bristol in 1781. So their history goes way back. And now we have George Young. George Young mar married Carolyn Louise Reed, and she was a daughter of Thomas Reed, pioneer East Grand Rapids. Um, Thomas Reed was the son of Porter and Polly Reed, who came here in 1834. So uh, the, the Young family married into the Reed family. And here we have a picture of Porter of Porter Reed, who lived from 1812 to 1857, and his son Thomas Reed. And they all were involved in local government, uh, justices of the peace. Uh, Thomas Reed was one of our first village presidents. Uh, presidents. And he also owned and operated Manhattan Bathing Beach. So in, in 2016, that house was torn down and they I think they rebuilt another farmhouse there, the popular white farmhouses. So now let's continue on down Lake Drive towards East Town. And let's see a little bit about where the Reed family lived. The Reed family came here in 1834. They followed Judge Ezekiel Davis, who came here about a month or two before that. But the Reed family came, and they were such important civic leaders and so forth, that by 1850s, the lake was named after them. Louis Reed, he built a home near Argentina and Floral, and he built the first schoolhouse. They taught it in their, their upstairs in their first house first, and then they built a schoolhouse, a log cabin on the shore of Reed's Lake, kind of behind where the public safety building is, right in that general area. Ezra Reed, uh, Lewis and Ezra were brothers. Porter was their nephew. Uh, Ezra Reed built a home on the west shore of the lake near what is the Lakeshore Club Apartments, and he was the first Kent County Sheriff. And Porter Reed, their nephew, he had a cabin near the lake, but, or what is now Lake Drive and so forth. And he was a farmer and he was a civic leader and he owned, I believe it was three large farms up and down uh, Lake Drive to what is now East Town. Thomas Reed was Porter and Polly's son. And he was a Grand Rapids Township Supervisor, Justice of the Peace, EGR village president, and he owned Manhattan Bathing Beach on Reed's Lake. Um, this is a little drawing of the section that the Reed family bought, section 34, in what is now called Reed's Lake. In earlier years, it was known as Grand Lake and Robinson Lake after Rick's Robinson. And this is the actual land grant that Lewis and Ezra Reed got from the government. Uh, signed by Andrew Jackson when they obtained their properties in what is now East Grand Rapids. The Reed Farm, there's a fanciful drawing from that, of that too, from the 1876 Kent County Historical Atlas. And the Reed Farm was right, right um, basically about where um, Wealthy Elementary School is, right in that general general area. Two, I'm sorry, two 360 acre farms that stretch from Norwood. So it was almost to East Town. Porter Reed, EGR pioneer. And Thomas Reed married um, Mary Walker Reed. And together they built their family. And Thomas Reed farmhouse was on Lake Drive. We'll see a picture of that. This is the home, it was not the original farmhouse. The original farmhouse was more towards Benjamin and, and uh, wealthy and so forth, but this was on their property too. And this house was built here in 1884 at 1630 Lake Drive and it is still there. 
I wish that it had a historical plaque on it. Someday maybe we'll get it and some, someday it will be preserved, hopefully. But by 1920, Homer Zip, a real estate agent, was listed at this address. Thomas uh, Reed did buy and uh, die in 1910. Uh, the Reed family owned and operated a Manhattan bathing beach in the mid to late 1880s. Before that, Charles Seidel, who was a harbor master and a boat builder, managed Manhattan, but I believe it was the Reed family and the Pierce family that owned all that property over on the north side of the lake. Um, Charles Seidel married uh, Thomas Reed's daughter, Kitty. The marriage was short-lived. Thomas Reed took the property back and he owned and operated it until he passed away in 1910. And then his daughter, uh, Kitty, and her husband, Charles Morgan, took it over. This is my favorite illustration of all time. And this was an illustration from 1914 of Manhattan Beach with all, in all of its glory. Charles Seidel, he was charged with bigamy and he got in a little bit of trouble for that. And that didn't go over too well with the Reed family who the daughter had married. And then the marriage was dissolved and she married Charles Morgan. And this is the house that uh, Charles Seidel lived in. And that was his marina. That was his boat building business. He had a, another one closer to where the middle school is now. But this is where he lived through the years. He was a boat builder and he became quite popular. And he was a swimmer and he saved a lot of people that fell off of boats and what have you. Uh, but Kitty uh, Reed married Charles Morgan after she left uh, Seidel. And they owned and operated Manhattan Beach after her father, Thomas, died. And here's an 1880s uh, view of Manhattan Beach with its glorious water toboggans and its bathhouses where you could come and you could borrow a, ba a well bathing suit for the day. You could eat your lunch there. You could picnic in the gazebos and the, that, that were around there were little pavilions. Uh, there was entertainment like hot air balloon launches. And here is one of those uh, pictures that was taken in, in Ramona Park, a little photo booth, the uh, Crescent Moon. And right in the back here is Kitty Reed Morgan and her mother, Mary, Walker Reed, who was married to Thomas Reed. This was taken about 1913. Now we're going back to a postcard. There are several postcards of Manhattan Beach and the big water toboggans and the, and the big bathhouses. The bathhouses were built over. Morgan's rebuilt them and they made them, made them larger. So now the Reed-Morgan connection goes down Wealthy Street, which was for, formerly Michigan. 1912-ish, it became for sure well, uh, wealthy in this section. The Morgans, Kitty and Charles Morgan, operated our first general store and post office in the building that is currently Crazy Charlie's. And other businesses that have been in this particular building through the years, Antox Bakery, several bakeries, Duchess Bakery, East End Pastries, Buttercup Bakery, the East End Pastries, Spirit Shop, American Laundry, Sheldon Cleaners, and Crazy Charlie's. But what does it look like inside? What did it look like inside? Back about 1913, this is the interior, and there's Charles Morgan sitting in the back, and his son Russell in the white shirt in the front there. And I imagine if they took the drop ceilings out in there, we might see some of those old bead board, board ceilings. And I think back then it, it encompassed that whole building. And now we have several other businesses behind Crazy Charlie's. Now we're gonna hop onto another subject. And we're gonna hop into a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I wish I could have lived during this time period and like chained myself to this building and kept it. Uh, built in 1851, the Lovett Bernard home, also known as the Kindergarten House, was demolished in, 18, in 1963. This is the only section, only part of that schoolhouse that is still around. And it is in the driveway of the Heirloom Antique House. This is the brick, the Grand River stone from which the Lovett Bernard home was built. 
The Love of Bernard House was built in 1851, and it was built on high ground in what is now wealthy elementary school property. And it uh, was a beautiful gingerbread house, like I said, made of Grand River stone, the beautiful grays, the blues, the pinks, and so forth. It was built in 1851 by George Lovett, for whom the street is named, and it's constructed of a Grand River stone. It was sold in 1863 to Stephen Bernard, whose son Edmund in 1890 was the first East Grand Rapids man to be elected to the State House of Representatives. And Edmund made a, played a big part in EGR becoming a village in 1891. And as a matter of fact, he did. He was important. In, the, in 1963, it was torn down in August. There were many reasons, but the main reason is sports. Uh, it was said to have been unstable but there was big discussion on how they needed that space for a practice field because the, um, they were losing some practice space elsewhere. So Dr. Clifford Nelson, who established the Heirloom Antique House said, I'm gonna pay for that house to be deconstructed and I'm gonna keep all the pieces and someday I'm gonna put that back together again. And wouldn't have that been lovely? If anybody knows where all the parts are for that, speak up. Um, so he uh, never rebuilt it, but he has parts of it in his driveway. He, of course, he has passed away years ago. Um, it was an inter a couple interesting things about that old house. It was rumored to have been a stop on the Underground Railroad. And for sure, the kids that attended, it was, a, it was a, known as a kindergarten house from about 1926 to 1963. So many kids went to kindergarten there and they remember that there was a door in the floor. Um, it was also rumored to have a ghost ride that would come to the top of the stairs at midnight, descend into the fireplace. And it also had a beautiful stone fence with an arched walkway and many romantic rock was taken there. So now we can see the old stone around Heirloom House. We can see some old views and we can see that that wall is still in the parking lot in front of Wealthy Elementary. And they really could have left that house and I would have claimed it for the history room because right now the history room is, is not very big and we need a building for our history room and museum. Close up from the side, you can see the Wealthy School smokestack back here. And here's the stone arch. And this is Norma Johnson right here who donated this picture. And here's a kindergarten class from 1956, 55, 56. And there actually were drawings done up of the Love at Bernard House. And it, they did up, the National Park Service did up drawings of structures that they felt were worthy of historical preservation. So we have some drawings that are available online. Show you how the rooms were all divided up. So when we leave the Love at Bernard House and we see road improvement out in front of the Love at Bernard House back in 1908 and what it was then Clinton Road and they're flattening the road and they're putting oil down during the summertime. But let's travel again and let's travel down Bratton Road, which was formerly East Paris Road. And let's go to a house that's kind of hidden between behind bushes and trees. And if you go and you go to the corner of Hall and uh, Bratton and you see Lakeside School and you look across the street on Hall, this is where this house is. It was built in 1900. And it's a big house, almost 5,500 square feet. It was built by Bertrand and Mary Kenyon. And Bertrand Kenyon was very important in local government. This house still stands. Bertrand Pardee Kenyon. And he was the last village president and the first city mayor. So we became a village in 1891. And we became uh, a city in 1926 into 1927. And he was very important. He had um, 
he was important to local government and he they got into it back then other people thought they were going to be village president and mayor john apsey back in in, in 18, uh, 1915, he thought he was going to be village president. Well, he didn't. It, um, Kenyon beat him out. He was also up against village president, uh, former village president O'Keefe, who had the hospital on Greenwood, which is a very important historical spot, too. And uh, village president George Forrester, who owned the, the blue house next to Starbucks, which is now Coldwell Realty. Bertrand Kenyon was co-owner of Adjustable Chair Company. He was a village president for 12 years. He was the first mayor. He was a chairman of the EGR Budget Committee. He was the president of Grand Rapids Park and Boulevards Association. It was very important. They wanted to get that boulevard in, especially Reeds Lake Boulevard way back when there was a big um, a lot of important men got together and formed that Boulevard Association. He was a member of the Elks and the Knight of Pythias and modern woodmen. Um, he bought a lot on, uh, on the north side of the channel between the two lakes from Charles Remington, who left property to the city to be a baseball field in Pertuatire. Um, forever, I mean. And Bertrand Kenyon lived until 1939, and his wife passed in 53. This is a picture of him in his obit. The two of them were married and buried in Cleveland. Kenyon Avenue, we used to have a Kenyon Avenue in East Grand Rapids. And in 1954, the street name changed from Kenyon Avenue to San Juan Drive. So we're right in this general area, right, right, right here. Let's travel down Lakeside Drive. And let's go visit the neighbors of George Young. And let's visit the estate of Frederick P. Wilcox. And this is a view from, it, from today. And you'll know, notice that this is across from Wealthy Elementary School. And this property was subdivided a good while ago. We're going to look at 1940 Lake Drive, which is the main, the, the first house that was built here by the Wilcox family, the Wilcox estate. This was built in 1888. It was built by Frederick Potter Wilcox and his wife, Carolyn Hill Wilcox. And they built this basically as their home away from the city because they had a place in Grand Rapids. It was, and it was to be their eventually their summer home and they lived permanently in the city of Grand Rapids. And I'm not doing a history of that house, but it is a Dutch colonial brick house in Grand Rapids. And I believe it's kind of a halfway house for women these days. And so they built that house in 1888. And Frederick was a real estate broker and financier, trustee on the EGR Village Board, village president. He was a big philanthropist, as was his wife after he passed. It was a 30 acre estate. And after he passed away, his wife, Caroline, uh, built other homes on this property and it basically became a family compound. Um, it, it, um, the streets San Lou Ray were named for Frederick's children, Sanford, Louise, and Raymond. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. And this is an aerial overview, basically what we see now. We see the main house right here, and here is Lake Drive out here. Now it's called Laurel Sea Circle. And here is the former recreational area, squash court. I think it had an indoor swimming pool and lottery facilities. And, and there were a few other houses, a summer house, former summer house on San Lou Bay, which was torn down. Laurel Circle was planned on the former Wilcox estate by 2000 or so, and that's when the estate was subdivided. Barbara, Barbara Wilcox Amberg, the last 
real connection. The daughter of Sanford Wilcox agreed to the sale in 2003. Let's look at some old photos. The beautiful archway and this archway is still there. If you get onto the compound, you can see this in the old family photos and the kids in their picnic. There's a courtyard, it's a beautiful courtyard. Um, I don't, it's private property, so you probably can't walk on it, but you could drive down there and peek in. This is what it looks like these days. This was done, uh, this picture, I took this picture during a symphony open house. They did a designer house uh, tour in here and it's absolutely beautiful. One of the former mayors of East Grand Rapids now lives in this, um, redone recreational building. It's beautiful. This is what it looks like now. It's beautiful. In 2012, a new old house was moved to Laurel Circle. The house that used to be on San Lu Rey was owned by Wally and Becky Knack. Mrs. Knack was a high school teacher at East Grand Rapids High School. And for years, she this was a Spanish style home. For years, she had great Gatsby parties here with her English class. And this is the house that was picked up and moved. Another family bought the property that this house stood on. They didn't want this old house. So a person bought this house pretty much for a song, but it wasn't so cheap moving it. And they moved it. It took a while, moved it up the hill and onto Laurel Circle. And that house is sitting there now. It's beautiful. Drive down Laurel Circle, take a peek. So now let's continue our tour. Let's go down Lakeside to Robinson Road, um, circa 1910s. And here's that old postcard again of Robinson Road. And let's travel to the southwest corner of, of Robinson Road in Lakeside Drive. And let's talk about what was on this property from 1837 to 1955. This is another thing that makes me very sad. Um, this area's first hotel stood on this property and it was known as the Fisk Lake Inn or the Lake House or the, it was a little inn. It was on Robinson Road and Robinson Road was an old trail, Indian trail that you could travel out to the Ada area. So it was a really great place properly located. And here we have another fanciful drawing. And this is, you can see the lake house right here. This was built by John Fisk and we'll talk about him in a second. And this is a fanciful drawing. We can see two lakes from here, which you really can't in real life. You can see Reeds Lake over here and you can see Fisk Lake here. And you could see the channel between the two lakes. And there was a bridge over Lakeside Drive back too. We don't have that anymore either. This is or was the Fisk Lake Inn. This is the second entity of it. It did start as a log cabin and then it was built into this two and a half story building. Upstairs, you could stay for the night. They called square dancing up there. You could eat. You could just come for parties. It was, it was a fantastic place. So John Fisk came here in 1837 and he settled here and he purchased 200 acres of property from Lucius Lyon. And we know him from Grand Rapids history. And he built his log cabin, which was recognized as the first hotel. It was a tavern, later to be rebuilt in brick. In 1839, he, the land lordship was transferred to James Fosgett, a man of French descent. And his wife is a niece of President Adams. But Fisk still keeps property. In the 1870s, Jerome Trowbridge is landlord. And then in also uh, Napoleon and Boney Carpenter is landlord. So it changes hands. It changes landlordship a few times. John Fisk in 1871 has sold land, but he's reserves 10 acres to build himself a family home. And by 1870s, he has uh, created the channel between the two lakes that was created and dredged. And this is another uh, common postcard of the channel between the lakes. 
by the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, East Grand Rapids City government, uh, for whatever reason, chooses to take the bridges out and lower the road so that you can no longer freely travel between the two lakes, which you could do for many, many years. Uh, the boats, as you can see um, in this article here, talk about getting little launch boats that could travel between the lakes with 37 people, could travel between the lakes in those little launch boats. The channel between the lake was known as the Interlochen. And I believe that that's where the East Grand Rapids High School got the name for its yearbook. That's what the yearbook is called, the Interlochen. And they talk about the east end of Reeds Lake known as the Devil's Kitchen. So I don't know more about that, but I need to check on that. But let's continue on our little trip. Let's continue on looking west on Robinson Road. And here is that old uh, street sign that now is in the East Grand Rapids History Room. And hooray for me. And uh, form formerly Thornapple Road, Rob Robinson Road now. In 1904, that uh, Fisk Lake Inn changed hands again. And in 1904, Judson West and his son, Ben E. West, Grand Rapids drugstore uh, businessmen, purchased that property that has the Fisk Lake Inn on it. And they build a house and the house address will be 2100 Robinson Road. And it still is 2100 Robinson Road today with an entirely different house. And we'll talk about that. And this is kind of the layout of the property. Uh, the Fisk Lake Inn stood here on the corner back from it. And the West family built their family home and they named it Dulox. And Dulox was a uh, two and a half story Georgian revival, red brick, beautiful, beautiful home. And they, what they did is they built a 17 room home, they named it Dulox. And to them, Dulox meant two lakes, meaning from up on their property and their properties way up high over Fisk Lake, they said they could see two lakes. Dulox to them meant two lakes. They converted the old inn to a stable for their horses and later a garage for their cars and up above their caretakers lived. And uh, this is Ben E. West. E did not stand for anything, just the letter E. He married um, Antoinette Wurzburg of the Wurzburg family fame. And they bought the property. They built the house by 1904. The Fisk Lake Inn is transformed into a stable and then a garage. Here it is in later years when it's very overgrown. And 2100 Robinson Road, Dulox, absolutely beautiful. And we see Ben E. West and his father sitting in the back and his uncle um, right here. So the West family arrived here in Michigan in 1854. And Judson is, is credited with helping to establish the business district in Lowell. They moved to Grand Rapids in 1888. They set up their drug stores, but they first were involved in the coal industry. And they joined with his son, Ben, to establish drug store, West drug stores in Grand Rapids. There are plenty of postcards on the West drug stores too. This is their drug store downtown. We have a few bottles from their drugstore in the history room. This is Dulox view from the back from Fisk Lake. This is the West family out in their boat on Fisk Lake and this lantern down here that was the running light. We have that in the history room. Um, Antoinette West who married Ben E. West was a daughter of uh, Frederick W. Wurzburg, the Wurzburg department store patriarch. And here she is with her siblings. And one of them was Marguerite Clark, who married Edmund. And the Clark home on Lake Drive, we'll see a picture of it. So there's a connection between the Clark home, the Clark family, 
and the West family and the Wurzburg family. And, you know, they're all big Grand Rapids entrepreneurs. So here is Antoinette uh, West with her granddaughter, Helen. And here's old man Wurzburg right there. And there's another Helen West Osier. Helen, the granddaughter of Ben E. West, eventually um, was given the old house, Dulac's house. She did get that was left to her. Here's a picture of Wurzburg and his children out in front of the Clark home. So there's a connection there. There's also a connection. Um, Mr. Wurzburg married several times and his family would tell you that they had several, he had several litter, litters of children. And one of them also was a Logie. There was a Logie branch too. Former um, uh, Grand Rapids Mayor Logie is also a grandson of Mr. Wurzburg. And the Clark home was built um, by Augustus Paddock. Um, and then it became the Clark home. And then it was the Franciscan home from 1941 to 82. Then it was Gibson's, that fantastic restaurant. And then it was bought by the Gil Gilmore, Gilmore, not Glenmore, Gil Gil sorry. And then it became Mangiomos and now it's Paddock Place again, which goes back to its, its origin being built by Mr. Paddock. And here's a picture of the Wurzburg, um, West, Logie, Bloomer. So there's a connection there, I believe, with Betsy Bloomer for, uh, for you know, and um, there's all uh, just connections. It's a small world in Grand Rapids. I think that happens a lot between big uh, people in the, in the community. They, there's a lot of connections. <clears throat> Another picture inside Dulocs. The marble fireplace back here was imported from Italy back in, in uh, 1904. And now we have Helen Osier West, the granddaughter of Benny West, now has Dulox, the house. And there are her daughters. And there's Sally. And there's, there's Sally. There's Anne. And there's Peggy um, Osier. And here's Peggy Osier Fairbanks, granddaughter of uh, Antoinette. And all those daughters were so uh, treated so specially. We have a beautiful book that explains their whole family history in the history room. Stop in and see it. In 1955, Helen Osier, the granddaughter, didn't like such a big house anymore. She preferred a modern ranch. So she had lots of property. In a, in a nutshell, she said to a builder, you know, hey, this is too big for me. I really don't need 17 rooms. Um, what can I do? I will give you a parcel of land here if you take a story and a half off of my house and made it make it into a one-story ranch. So they did. Old mansion is restyled for modern living. And this is what it looked like until probably about 10, 12 years ago. And that house was torn, bought and torn down. And this is what stands there now, 2100 Robinson Road. It is owned by a big uh, Grand Rapids grocery store businessman. He owns that property. And that is a primo spot out in the backyard. It's a, just looks over Fisk Lake. It's absolutely a beautiful spot. Around the corner on Plymouth Avenue. And this is, this is going to, I'm gonna zoom through this because we're not gonna finish the Wurzburg house, but not old man Wurzburg, his son. Um, this was the home of uh, Frederick A. Wurzburg, son of the patriarch. And this is on the corner of Plymouth and um, Robinson Road, still stands, been remodeled a little bit through the years, but not extensively. Upstairs, there was a grand little stage where you could perform. And as a matter of fact, a dancing girl did. And she married him eventually. Pictures through the years. It was a 7,000, almost 8,000 square foot house on one acre of land. And Osgood and Osgood Architectural Firm built the house. And 
uh, Frederick A. was very involved in music and he directed music at the Powers Theater and he was a composer of stage plays and he directed a boys orchestra. And then he eventually became in charge of a Wurzburg Arts Linen Store and Wurzburg Dry Goods. And this is a picture of Frederick A. And this is a picture of his first wife. His first wife um, was Chloe Bell, um, was actually uh, the daughter of, of uh, Captain Belknap. And um, she died and he, Belknap actually had a steamboat on Reed's Lake. So that's a whole other history we're not getting into now. She did pass away in 27, have no fear. He was very involved in local music in Ramona Park and the theater. And there were lots of dancing girls, especially Marcus Peaches. They traveled on the circuits and, and he became involved with Celeste Bush. And he married her in 1932 in the parish rectory at St. Stephen's. She was, um, she played at all kinds of stage performances at Ramona and one of them was called The Naughty Bride. And and upstairs, as I said, there was a little dancing floor. And it was rumored that, yes, she did do some dancing up there. And I was told this by Mr. William Bennett, who was a former historian and a great friend of mine. Um, through the years then, um, that uh, Frederick A. moved to this house on Robinson Road, and he, he lived his days out there. Traveling down Plymouth Road. Um, Julie, do I have a... A um, couple more minutes. Um, I can continue with doing the history of this house and then we'll stop. Yeah, um, if, yeah if, a couple more minutes is fine. Okay, so we're gonna stop at this, at this house and then if, if we do another, um, if you come to my second presentation, we'll go down more roads and look at more houses. This house, was just demolished within the past two years. It's known as the Peck House. And it's at 255 Plymouth Road. It's Road, not Avenue. And it's an empty lot there right now. It has been purchased. It was built in 1932, looks older, but it's a, of an older style. It was built by Percy Peck and his wife, Mary Ellen. And he was the son of the infamous couple that were poisoned and the subject of a book or two or an article of many articles. They married in 1902, but the house was built in 1932 and pictures through the years. A Peck drugstore downtown corner of Monroe and Division established circa 1876. And this building is still there now, has other businesses in it, other views of the Peck building. Poisoning the Pecks of Grand Rapids is a good read. Probably a lot of you have read it already. Um, and it really, it doesn't talk about this house, but it does talk about the family that uh, was murdered in, in 1916. Percy Peck's parents were murdered. They were murdered by this gentleman here who married his sister. And basically uh, Dr. Arthur Waite, who was a dentist, he was kind of a fraud too. Um, he was a Grand Rapids boy and he set his sights on on Clara Peck because of her money. Long story short, he had a girl on the side. They moved to a fancy place in New York. And within a short period of time, both of her parents died. And Percy, not Percy, um, 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 Arthur Waite, I should say, um, had it and within his power to get all, get into laboratories and get all different types of germs of typhoid, diphtheria, TB, and he also was able to get arsenic. And the father, the mother was uh, went first, and they were of course traumatized. But then within a few weeks, the father went, and basically, you know, he kept giving him. Um, germs, feeding him germs in his food and his soup and so forth. And then they say that it was probably arsenic, which took him out. So there was a great trial in 1916. And Arthur uh, Warren Waite killed Percy's father, killed Percy's mother, Hannah. 
And then there was, somebody sent a clue um, saying that this is there's something fishy here. And they looked into it and they found out that he was a murderer and he was sent to Sing Sing and he was electrocuted on May 24th, 1917. And I guess he went with a smile on his face. He thought it was amusing. Um, fast forward um, many, many years, different people live in the house. The house is beautiful. It's, and and um, it, was, it was purchased in 2002 by David Nevin of the Catholic Fellowship Church of North America. And he wanted to use it as a church, but he had to fight with City Hall. And he, but eventually he, he bought the place and he was so upset, he was told he couldn't run his church services in there. It wasn't zoned for church services. And I was at the city meeting and he was, you are condemned to eternal punishment and death. And he was very upset. And so he purchased the house and he let it fall into disrepair. And so a couple years ago, water uh, pipes had burst in the wintertime and black mold had set in and someone purchased the house. And instead of trying to repair it, they tore the house down. So that it was incorporated as a Catholic church and it was listed at that address, but there were less than, you know, maybe a dozen people in the area that practiced that faith. So nothing really came of it. So this is the end of part one, which will be continued. And in part two, some of the things that would be included would be the Bissell estate, the John Paul home, Point Paulo on Reeds Lake, fantastic. Steamboats and their homes and where they lived and what they did. Cricket Hill, the Baker Estate, farmhouses on Bratton Road, Burleson Sanitarium Hospital, and perhaps more. So with that, um, I will stop my little discussion here. And um, if anyone has questions or if you'd like to email me with questions or you're just tired of hearing me talk, we can stop here. Can we open it up, Julie? Yes. Um, so Angela. first, I want to say thank you so much, Mary, uh, for that engaging and very interesting uh, presentation. Very informative. Um, and I look forward to hearing part two and three, it sounds like, as well. Well, you, um, know, you can't shut me up once I get started. <laughs> No worries. Um, and I, there are some questions in the chat. Um, some okay. of them we weren't able to get to when you were presenting. Um, oh, but... I didn't see any. Oh I... yeah, no worries. Uh, so I'm going um, to- I, I can look them. at them now. Oh, I can um, read it to you. Uh, okay, I think you can see them here right now. Yeah, just one. Is there, uh, one of them is, what was the reason for Kenyon to change to San Juan or San Juan? Um, Good question. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. There are a lot of street names changed through the years. A lot of them did. And that could have been something that the um, uh, Wilcox family worked on. But let me just tell you that a lot of streets did change. Um, Argentina Drive now used to be Masonic Avenue because the Masonic home was there. That's another story. Breton was Lake Street and then East, and East Paris Road. Briarwood was Leona, Eastwood hmm. was Oakland, Gladstone was called Resident, um, Indian Trail was Pasadena and Mangian, that goes with Point Paulo, um, and there's a whole list of things that got changed. Um, San Jose changed to, was Henry Avenue, so I can, you know what, I will work that into my second talk. How about that? Awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then another question is, do you have any background on who Lovett was? Um, and then they have a comment. I have heard that there is a Lovett block downtown GR. Um, is that related at all? It very well could be. Um, Lovett was in local politics and so forth. Let me do up some more on Lovett. And I do have slides on that. We did, I didn't talk, go over it too in too much detail so there also was a um yeah let me put that in part two okay or we can i could post it and where can we post the answers um that is a good question for julie <laughs> okay um, well let's yeah uh well 
so one thing um, Julie mentioned is if you have any other questions for Mary, um, you can email her at egrhistoryroom uh, at gmail.com. Yes. Um, yes. And then, yeah, uh, and you can get answers to those questions directly. Um, yes, and please follow the um, East Grand Rapids History Room on Facebook. Yes, yes. There's a couple more questions here, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any history on the Manhattan Lane homes? Uh, the Manhattan, the ones that are there now? I'm they guessing. Were built, okay, well, you know, after Manhattan Beach closed, and it closed in 1927, that property was sold off um, by, um, a mis uh, and purchased by a Mr. Beach, which is kind of ironic. And he was, um, um, involved in Grand Rapids um, Township politics. He was also mm -hmm. a real estate dealer. And they, they wanted to sell that all that property off because they wanted to build you know, a whole residential area there. So in the 20s, some homes started to be built there. And then over the years, you know, that's a pretty new area. Um, okay. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it had all the old bathhouses and so forth. And those were all demolished to make way for some fantastic mid-century modern homes down mm -hmm. in that area. So I, I could, could put some of those in there too. Yeah, yeah. It there sounds too. like a lot of people are interested in the Manhattan. Um, there's another question about where the bathing beach was located, um, the Manhattan bathing beach. Yes, um, that was right at the end of Manhattan Road. If you follow to the end of Manhattan Road today um, and you get to the, the shore of Reeds Lake, right now it's a private neighborhood. Uh, you gotta live there and belong in order to um, uh, keep your boats and swim from there and picnic there. That's where it is. Now I can get into Manhattan a little bit more. I just, um, so I can go into Manhattan Beach a little bit more. I'm writing this down, so we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, we might have to have a park. It was a very fine, very, very fine beach. I think they even brought in some white sand and so forth to supplement the beach there. It was very sandy, very nice. Now, the lake got very deep very quickly. The lake is average of probably 20 feet, but it can be 52 feet at its deepest. So, you know, it, and there were there were people that did drown there. I mean, not tons, but some, there were cases of that either just going under the water and not being able to swim or falling out of a boat or whatever. So um, a lot of interesting history there. Sometimes they'd go on the toboggan there and they'd say they got injured and then there would be a big to do about, no, you didn't. And I don't know if there were any lawsuits, but there was a lot of discussion on that also. So. Yeah, it was a beautiful place, a beautiful place. And, you know, way back then, um, uh, when it was established in the 1880s, there weren't roads that went to all these places. I mean, very few. Most of the travel to get to those places were by launch boat or, but it was deep enough there at Manhattan for the big steamers who would displace a lot of water um, to actually come up to the big dock there or launch boats, they would put um, white flags on the end of the docks um, and people in the launch boats would come and retrieve people and take them back over to the west side um, to Ramona Park. And, or there were a lot of pavilions and picnic grounds and there were different baseball parks around the lake. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, no, it sounds like a very happening <laughs> uh, It was, place. it was, it really was. <laughs> Um, there is, a well, a couple of things. Um, there's another question from YouTube, but also I wanted to mention there's, well, and a comment, but first I wanted to mention, um, our survey. So before all the participants leave, if you could please fill out the Grand Rapids Historical Society survey, um, Julie and Nan have posted it in the chat. That would be super helpful for us. Um, and then also, uh, visit our YouTube page for more programming. Um, we have a lot of recorded programs there that you can go back to and, and see. Um, so one more comment. Uh, I remember one of the cottages from the Manhattan Beach Resort. It was my aunt and uncle's summer home. So that was from Lynn. Yes, um, yes. You know, in that area, if you go and drive around the lake, there are some little areas that, that, that 
uh, go in and out of East Grand Rapids. Some of them are Grand Rapids Township, and they're like little cottagey areas. There, you know, so it's um, there are some older places, but in that Manhattan Beach area, it was they wanted to get at and build new things. I wanted yeah. to say something here. Um, I wanted to say that I see that we have a few people here that are from local history. I see uh, Pat uh, Poisson O'Connor and her family ran, ran the steamboats on the lake. So I oh, hate wow. Pat and also Lynn Shackelford and her family. She's a Reed family descendant. Uh, I believe it's Porter and um, Thomas and, and her family ran that Manhattan beach uh, all of the facilities there. So, and we probably have some other people here too. Wow. So wanted to thank everybody for coming. Yeah. And then we also have one more question from YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a reason why there were so many street names uh, that changed to include San or San at the beginning? Is it all related to San Lu Ray's name change? Yeah, you know, I think it was just because they, they liked that, you know, with the with the with the Wilcox family, it kind of it, it kind of just went right along with it. But mm -hmm. I will I will do my due diligence and, and tell you more about because the street name changes are so interesting. So that yeah. might be something that I could really uh, talk up more next time. Yeah, it's so interesting how like history, we never know uh, all of it and we have to keep researching. The more we research, mm -hmm. it, it feels like we have to keep researching. <laughs> yes, and yeah. you know, another thing that I didn't talk about, we had this, this huge Masonic home that sat on the corner of Breton and what is now Lake Drive. And that burned, I believe it was 1910, yeah. Um, and on that property, it was torn down. Now, many of our houses now are built on that old Masonic home property. But the, the president of that, um, of the Masonic home, his son was named Maxwell. So the street, we have a street named Maxwell and Maxwell is named after his, his son. So, so, so I will talk about the street names. Yeah, it sounds like we have to so. do a part, part two. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I guess one, I want to thank everyone for coming uh, to this talk and this program um, and learning more about the local history. Um, and then second, just a reminder to fill out our survey um, and then check out our YouTube videos, um, pre-recorded videos and uh, also future events. Um, and then I want to thank Mary again for all of your time and putting forth this program as well and all the research that you're doing um and continue to do uh it's, it's a very passion. valuable it's yeah a passion. yeah definitely and um i can see it i can hear it in your voice of uh, how you know important it is for you and also you know for people to hear and learn about the the history so yeah thank you um, and if there's any final questions, 